So I'm going to bring our guest in. And our guest is Mirjana Gligorovic, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her ta travels. To start with, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, America, first of all. A little bit about myself. Um, as um, Dennis said, my name is Mirjana Gligorovic. I am 29 years of age. I, am, I live in Australia today, but I am originally from Bosnia. I was born in war. It was a very hard time for my parents and my mom went into a premature labor and yeah, I was born with cerebral palsy. Yeah. And yeah, all my life I really um, had some struggles with being accepted for who I am from when I was down there to when I immigrated to Australia in 2002, I wore a I think it's called an AFO, and I was known by the whole school as the girl with the plastic leg, and, and I didn't know how to speak the language, and it was just terribly hard for me. Yeah, I never really had many friends. I often used to hang out alone, and then I always knew that more was wrong to me than just my cerebral palsy. So halfway through high school, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Some people call Asperger's, some people call autism spectrum. I don't know how you'd like to refer to it. And that was actually a sign of relief that um, it explained why I was the way I was. And, but yeah, I feel like throughout my life, I've just been held by so many. I've just been held by, backed by so many people. I haven't had the chance to reach my full potential. When you have a mild disability like me, all it takes is just a little bit of extra patience or just a little bit of extra time for someone to understand you, but people don't have that either, unfortunately. And that goes in many aspects from teachers to relationships to school. So when I finished the, like a certificate for in tourism, yeah, I found travel to be my special interest. And I decided to go on my first solo travel trip back where I'm from. The region is called the Bal Balkans. But it's made up of um, it's made up of Greece, Albania, the former Yugoslav nations, which is Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, and where else have I gone? Yeah, Macedonia. Yeah, I think those were my countries that I traveled back a few years ago, and yeah, I just found it to be such a wonderful experience that I decided. Yeah, I decided to release a book to inspire the people about it, which I will tell you a little bit later on. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. What are some of the challenges you face when you travel? Oh, okay. As you have heard me mention, I have quite a few conditions. One of my condition, my primary condition is probably cerebral palsy. So with, um, with cerebral palsy, I can struggle a little bit body stiffness and stuff like that. So one plane flights can be a challenge for me. One of the tricks which I have learned with that is to always pick an aisle seat, which makes getting up and going for regular walks easier and prevents my body with numbness. Then there's the challenge because I also have mild CPU with my left hand. I'm getting my luggage off the I'm not sure what you call it, the cabin or on, or on and off independently where I just ask someone for help. Yeah. And on the two, yeah, I sometimes feel my balance can be a little bit off site and sometimes I find it difficult to, to keep up with the pace of other fast walkers. But one of the things which I, which has helped me as a person with a more physical disability is choosing a multi-aged travel group, no, no discrimination to young people here, of course, but when you're in a multi-age, there'll they, they always be someone who'll be a little bit faster and there's always be someone who'll be a little bit slower and a little bit more patient. Yeah. And I'm not afraid to just ask them for help if I can just grab onto their arm. Most of the time, people are really kind in that aspect. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. And what are some of the things, what are some of the things that you do, Mariana, to to cope with all of those, you talked about the ILC, but given the challenges you face, uh, if you would like to talk about individually how you handle those. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, I've talked about the challenges relating to my CP and how I handled those, didn't I? Um, I can move on to the aspect with my autism now. So with my autism, one of the things which is a struggle for me, like the most people on the spectrum, is the sensory overload. I'm just very sensitive to loud them. Yeah, but I came very organized. I came to show you what I do. I'm quite with it. I actually brought these boys headphones. My headphones are a little bit of are a little bit old fashioned. They're a little bit outdated, but you can find newer versions on Amazon. And you see the here has the option where you I can't get the camera right. It has the you probably can't see on camera, but it's on and off. It turns on this little, like, it's not a complete noise blocker, but it provides such a calming effect to me when I'm oversensitive with the noise and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's the noise aspect of it. And then there's another aspect when you get a little bit nervous, how people on the spectrum are a little bit nervous with different routines or different environments and time changes. One of the tricks which helps with that, I find, and which has helped me greatly when I went over to the Balkans was going and spending a few times with my family or for you guys, it can be in a hotel or wherever before the tour, before the actual tour starts, it gives you the day to take in the different time zones and year. And then there's also one more, actually two more tips, which I have for which could be helpful for travel with autism and cerebral palsy. I have learned more recently that just like with physical disabilities, autism also qualifies for pre-boarding pass. So you can get into the plane when it's still nice and quiet and there's no sensory overload. And one of the other things which is great, not just for autism, but for any physical, dis not physical, invisible disability like you. Probably for you and your ADHD, you can even go for things like depression or deafness or stuff like that. They have, I'm not sure if it's available in every part of US at the moment, but I know it's available in parts of UK and parts of Australia. They have these green sunflower lanyard, which you put around your neck and they have a little card, card which fixes your condition and it offers more help like so make you eligible for pre-boarding or if you need more help whether the airport staff can discreetly come river to you and help get you ready on your flight which is great yes and it's interesting that uh, you talked about the sunflower lanyard where i had run into it and, and i'm fine without one but some of the cruise lines use it so that if somebody is on board that's on the spectrum especially with young really young ones and really old ones that could get very confused or, or upset when the staff sees that, they know that they need help, that they're not acting out. And that's important. Oh, oh yeah, that, that's an important tip. Yeah, you will not learn something. Thanks for sharing it with me. Okay, you wrote a book. And so you want to tell us about your book? Yeah, I sure did. Yeah, I have the book with me. It's called My My Belkin Heart. People often confuse the word Belkin with the word broken, <laughs> my broken heart, and it's actually my Balkan heart. So Balkan is the name of the region in Southeast Europe where I traveled to a year. I mentioned all those countries in the first question and I'll bring my book. So with my book, one of the things which has, as, as I said, after I discovered my big passion for travel, that is definitely one of the things which, um, which has inspired me to release this and as I talked about the struggles of being a person with a mild disability, that's another reason why I decided to write this book because I, yeah, I have just struggled so much with employment and getting a job. So I thought I might as well make my own book, which is start something by myself, which is being an author. And I do truly believe that travel is a big factor in living life to the fullest. And so that's why I decided to, to release this book. Um, to for a number of reasons. Number one is obviously to have help people see what the fully lived like from what my version looks like. And the, the second version is the 
as you can see in the photo, the Balkans do look relatively untouched. So I want to raise a little bit of awareness about the beauty of, about the beauty of the, this region, which a lot of them, I would say nobody's heard of it, but I would say it still remains relatively undiscovered. And I know, especially during the nineties, it got a lot of bad propaganda and yeah, bad things from the media. So I wanted to break a few travel misconceptions and misconceptions about the people and the culture. Yeah, and I just thought it would be nice to introduce that world for what it really is. Uh, that's very nice. I, and it's interesting because I and Cheryl all do this, some of the same things because we try to break the misconception, the fact that if you have mobility challenges, you should stay home. Yeah, we try to help people see that it's okay to go and do and enjoy. And yes, yeah, so one of the things which I have made all the days away and the world is definitely getting more accessible for people with a disability. One of the, one of the main, one of the, sure, so, so, so sorry, sorry, just a little while, while I like process it. One of the main eye openers, which I have saw, which made me see how eye-opening how more accessible the world is getting for people with a disability. When I was in Athens, I was walking on the Acropolis and it was all the dirty and steady and, and rocky. The ground was uneven. I was having trouble balancing as a person with mild cerebral palsy and oh, I had to grab onto some tour guide saying for help. But then in the middle of it, I saw an elderly woman in a wheelchair. And it made me think, oh, they are, they are, that's beautiful. So even if people, even if people in wheelchairs and all that, even if they can't experience some things to the full extent, having just a little taste or just a little opening or view to something, yeah, it is a big, it makes a big difference. Uh, and, and that is so true. Joe and I always appreciate it when there's, when they've made special efforts to make a path or something that works for people in wheelchairs. Um, Cheryl's fortunate. She has a wheelchair that's pretty good on rough ground. We were in Rome recently and where all the cobblestones are and her wheelchair was fine on it. Okay. And noisy, but it was fine. Uh, Australia has also designed them, um, uh, what is called a um, magic mobility wheelchair. Well, I can't tell you the specifics. You might have to look it up yourself, but, but it's a great wheelchair. It, it enables you to, uh, to adapt and it's, it's very adaptable and an electronic, it functions very well. It is quite expensive at the moment, but one of my friends said that it's worth every cent. Yeah. And yeah, yeah but um, other than that, talking about breaking the misconceptions when I travel, one of the reasons why I have released this book is not just um, for disability misconceptions, but, it was, but it's also from, from a cultural perspective from, yeah, yeah, prof for cultural reasons, yeah, because as I said, um, that part of the world, especially when I'm from, they received a lot of negative propaganda from the Western countries, and yeah, it has beautiful pictures which show, yeah, I'll just give you a sneak peek example, which shows what the world is, and yeah, I just thought it would be very nice if somebody has a taste or has a view to see a place for what it really is. Oh, and I think that's so helpful. And, and looking at the pictures in your book, I looked on Amazon and thumbed through some of the pages there and looked at it. And again, it, but is, it looks like a very beautiful country. And things have changed there significantly since right after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Things uh, There was a lot of some challenges immediately after that, sorting things out. But I look forward to a time when I can get up there to visit. There are so many places. I haven't been to Australia and I, I have a bad desire to go there, but I haven't been to the Balkans. I haven't been to Greece. We did do Spain and France, a little bit of Spain, France, and Rome or Italy, but so many places to see in so little time. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, that is another reason why, because it's not something that's um, the first option to go for many travelers, but for those travelers who are wanting to see as much of the world as they can, my, my book is a great insight and a great travel guide for, for those who will decide to go to the Balkans or how they can travel and make the most out of it.
Okay, so yeah. th does Croatia fall in the Balkans as well, or is it not part of the Balkans? Yeah, Croatia does as well. So it's all of the former Yugoslav states, Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, and Greece, Greece does, and Albania does, North Macedonia does, Slovenia does, but I haven't been to Slovenia just yet, and Bulgaria and Romania, they also do, but I haven't been there either. Okay, so I, actually I will be in, because we're going on a cruise in... May of next year, we'll start from Barcelona, but we'll wind up going around Italy, go to Malta, and then we're going to go to Split and Dubrovnik, and then uh, from Dubrovnik to back to Venice. So I'll, I'll have a little chance to visit a piece of the Balkans. I know, I know one day in Split, one day in, in uh, uh, Dubrovnik is not a, yes. a tour of yes. the Balkans, but. But that does sound beautiful, and I have also mentioned. Yeah, I have also been to Dubrovnik and Split, and I have also mentioned in those places in Croatia, I have some good tips for accessibility with a wheelchair, You're getting into the beach with a wheelchair where they have good options. Yeah, but other than that, yeah, Croatia is a beautiful country because, because it has the beach. It has the most beautiful beaches on the Balkans, but yeah, I feel like there's other beautiful parts of the Balkans too. Yeah, it has more start. And Serbia, um, it, it shares a... Uh, border with seven different countries, but it's one of the least visited. But Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, that will always have a special place in my heart because yeah, yeah, a lot of it's a very humble place with humble people and a lot of childhood memories I have coming from Belgrade. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because I had a chance to interview somebody from Romania that does accessible tours. So we talked a lot about Ro Romania. And uh, by the way, Rhonda said, Mirjana, wh what a, an amazing story. She really appreciates your sharing. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. And talking about the road, talking about Romania and how you're going on a, cru on a cruise, that, that actually reminds me of something else. So that Daniel, which is one of the... So, so sorry, first of all, th thank you very much, Rhonda. See, I, I said with my autism, I maybe I might have an urge to go all over the place. Thank you for being very patient and not overwhelming me. Thank you very much for the very nice compliment. We traveled seven European countries and Belgrade that is on the banks of Sava and Danube. And also for those people who are wondering to do, who really like cruises and were interested in going cruising the Balkans, I might say that the boats often stop in beautiful part of Ohrid, which is North Mesa. It's, it's beautiful there. And I talk about that place in my book as well. Well, very nice. I, I have to get your book and read it because I think uh, it will be very handy when I go to that part of the world. And when I get to Europe, I may stay longer than I'm, I'm with a group uh, that I'm taking and hosting. And, but we may, Cheryl and I may stay longer because we often, if she has to fly that far because she's, she has problems with her back is fused and her hip, she's got replaced hips and replaced knee. Yeah. And so it's hard for her to fly a long time. In fact, when we went to Barcelona, we got her the, she traveled in, in business class with a lay flat seat so she could get stretched out and not have to sit for six hours on a chair. Yeah. But I, Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, so if we get to Europe, it's possible that we'll stay and do some other things because there is so much to see there. Yeah, they sure are. And the Balkans, the Balkans, a lot of people don't, a lot of people can't believe how close the countries are, especially Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, and the... And yeah, and Macedonia even. Yes, it, it has some very good, ba very good ba buses. It has some very good ba buses and very good bus options. And it, and it doesn't take very long to get from place A to place B by bus at all. Okay. All right. Yeah. Surprise. We found accessibility in the area we visited in Europe. Very good. Yeah. I would say better than in the U.S. because I could get accessible taxis. The buses were accessible. The tour buses, we did the hop-on, hop-off buses, and those were very accessible in all the places we went, the trains. I am looking forward to visiting more because of the ease of access, actually. I do talk about some of the challenges in my book. One of my challenges was that I've had difficulty for running a taxi. But yeah, I am, I am happy, as you are saying, that the world is becoming a more accessible place for people with uh, in a wheelchair and with a physical disability. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of doing your research a little bit ahead of time. And if you're going with a specific to a company, if you have their email or contact details, don't be afraid to email them specific questions. 
want an example, we will there be help with the airport trans or, or like it transfers from the reception to my hotel room. You yeah. can get some really good information. And that's very helpful information because, and, and that's, I, I got started doing this because it was so hard and you had to do so much research. So I'm like, okay, I'll do the research for people because that's something I'm good at. And with my ADHD, it makes it a, something that I, I enjoy doing because it's something different every few minutes. It's not the same thing all day. Uh, like I said, it worked out good from a couple of perspectives. Listen, Mijana, if you want to stay for just a few minutes, I I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and then you and I can talk for chat just a second afterwards. Okay. No, no worries. We forgot. Oh, thank you very much, Adia. We forgot to answer some of the other questions, which is well, what, what advice do you have for people with a disability who may be afraid to travel? Um, okay. You like you to talk to that then. I, I forgot we had that question. So go ahead and. Tell me about it. Yes. yes. So travel is a very broad term. So when you, when you say travel, there, there are a few different regions, actually, no, not a few different regions, like a few different bases. So there's obviously bus, plane, the, the, there's a car, trip, travel, and a train and a boat. So yeah, travel in itself is a very broad term. So you can think about what feels the most accessible for you and read research a little bit about that too. I will, I can share one of my other challenges, which I had, which I had and how I overcame it, what inspired me and made me think, oh, I can actually travel. So one of the things which has been, I'm very high on my to go to list was Switzerland and the Swiss mountains. But I have often thought to myself, oh, how will I get over the steep hills and all that kind of stuff. And then um, when I talked to a few people who have actually been there and who have actually, which I'm interested in, they, they said the walking component isn't that much of a challenge because the train ride gets you everywhere. And it's about, it's about, um, more, more about when you get up, you have a little sneak peek of the places, but it's one of the things which is a challenge is the high altitude levels. Thank you, Ron. And it's interesting because you talked about that. Uh, my wife, in addition to the our physical challenges, she does not like heights at all. And going up oh, the one with the cogs, anyway, or a tram or something like that, those are pretty yeah. much no-goes for her. Same as for Pam, who's with us today. She and my wife are very similar in that they don't like heights. We actually uh, visited Pam and up in uh, Nova Scotia on a cruise last fall, and neither of them wanted the heights. But for me, it wasn't bad. I, I managed to get Cheryl into a tram. And she was doing okay with her eyes closed. And then I said she should look out and see oh, the okay. view. And then for the rest of the time, I can't use the audio from that video. I have the video, but I can't play the audio. Because it's here enough. Um, so one of the things which um, my advice would probably be, so if, if you're going to places like that, oh, I'm just reading the comments. Thanks so much. Me too. No, hi. Say hello. So one of the things which does help in, in those situations is, is, is researching on the internet how to get used to different altitude levels. Some people believe that um, having some teas may help reduce the anxiety. Yeah, it's a little bit similar to getting doing research on different time zones, but yeah. No, it, it's interesting. I, I grew up uh, in in the mountains and I've never had a problem with altitude sickness, though I've lived out in flat country down close, close to sea level for the last the last 30 years. So if I went back to the mountains now, it might be very different because that area is pretty thin up there. Hmm. It makes for great views, but it uh, makes for a little bit of shortage of oxygen sometimes. Yeah. And that all, that also brings me to, it, it reminds me when I was in Meteora, which is a part of Greece, I climbed so, so many stairs, probably hundreds of stairs. And that was probably one of the highlights of my travel. And I felt on top of the world. Oh, yeah. It's very nice to be able to get up and to see. I, I said, I, I love going. If I had lived in the U.S. back in 150 years ago, I'd have been out in front of a wagon train taking a group of settlers to see what was over the next hill. Mm -hmm. Because And I, I read a quote once I'll share, and I thought it was so much, and it kind of ties to what you've done. It, it said that travel is like a book, and people that don't travel have only read one page. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And another quote, which I also use, travel not to escape, but like this, so that life does not escape us. 
And that is one of the reasons why I released the book. Yet, as I said, I believe that travel is a big factor in living life to the fullest. And I hope that I might encourage people to live life to the fullest. And yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure it will. Okay, like I said, we'll say goodbye to the audience and the new ink chat for just Thank a second. Thank you so much for everybody who's tuned in and listened to me. Thank you so much for all your support. And let me say thank you in advance for those people who intend on purchasing my book. I love great reviews.